Hi, I'm uh, Dr. David LeBlanc. I'm a physicist, researcher, inventor, little of this, little of that, uh, based in Ottawa, Canada, and uh, working on uh, molten salt reactors, which are the way of the future, and we're, we're working hard to, to make that come true. What problems are you trying to tackle that you don't feel we could just tackle by um, trying to make our operations and life more efficient? Well, you definitely want to do both, but I don't think we can get where we want to be just by reducing consumption and we've been trying for decades and not really doing much reduction. Um, it's all well and good to just imagine everyone will stop driving their cars or traveling on jets and but it's pragmatically it's not going to happen so if we don't want to go around these roads of global warming and resource wars etc we need other options we want less expensive power, we want more politically stable power, and that's hopefully what this technology can, can help give us. You mentioned um, in your presentation that uh, China is building a, a salt reactor. They're not going to do this super fast, or at least do a great job super fast. Um, but we wish them the best of luck. They need, uh, I think some people get worried about China then controlling the world energy, they're not going to be exporting anything for a long time. They have massive energy needs themselves, that the only real option they have now is burning incredibly dirty coal. Um, so I wish them the best of luck. I'm not worried of them uh, out-competing other or other organizations, countries on, on bringing this to the rest of the world. They're going to be, they could build hundreds, thousands of them for themselves for decades to come. So. You're, you're looking at it from a, are they going to build reactors and sell reactors? Do you think uh, there's a concern about intellectual property in that same sense? Yes, but uh, I have intellectual property that I don't think the Chinese have. Uh, uh, intellectual property patents are not meant to stop someone from, from developing a product. They can force you to give royalties to that inventor of the product. Um, I'm not too worried of them suddenly having some design that's so much better than anything else we can do. And it comes back to the fact there's a lot of different ways you can design molten salt reactors. And I'm certainly not worried of them patenting every possible good way you can do these. I think there's, there's best ways you can do them and simplest ways. That's really my focus lately. Um, but yeah, if they want a patent, that's good. But not too worried about it. Do you have any suggestions for how um, you would have modified the 2011 version so it's more accurate or it better reflects your understanding? The focus seems to be on thorium itself and it's completely understandable that that is a necessary message to, to, to perk the ear up of the general public. Uh, but to me it's really about the reactors themselves and they're the best way to burn thorium but they're the best way to consume, consume uranium. Uh, so to me, it's not this uranium versus thorium and any scientist engineer that knows anything will kind of laugh at that statement. Um, it's really about a type of reactor that can be far superior to all other energy production and all other nuclear reactors. Uh, and they, they can be designed to be the thorium cycle. They work really well on a mix of uranium and thorium. They work remarkably well without any thorium at all, just regular uranium like the other light water reactors and can-dos are doing now. So, um, But that said, it's, I, I want, I'm not going to get the time it takes to convince the general public how a reactor is better, although they are so in, transparently better. It, it is pretty easy to get across. The ways that people or the problems that people have with conventional nuclear power are probably exaggerated. They're not as bad as people, as many people think. Uh, but the, the big problems they have with those, the molten salt reactors as a reactor, not just because they use one fuel versus another, it's the reactor and how we can run these that solve those problems that can maybe really change public perception, which is already better than people realize but we can maybe make it really, really good with this technology. What, is, um, what does Canada bring to the table in molten salt reactor technology? Why, 
whether or not Canada is a, a good place for this to be developed. And I think you spoke to that already in the conference, but just to have it in a, standing in front of a tree and saying. <laughs> <laughs> Is Canada well positioned to develop molten salt reactor technology? Yeah, I'd say surprisingly so. I'm Canadian, so obviously when I first got into this, it was Canadian organizations, our Atomic Energy Canada Limit, Limited. They were some of the first people I approached, but uh, that didn't go too well five years ago. They were very um, focused on the next generation of can-do design, the next generation of heavy water reactors, etc. I didn't get too much traction, so I kind of expanded to colleagues, collaborators around the world, uh, but knew I, with the changing dynamics here in Canada, the fact that the can-do part of ACL was privatized, sold to an organization who quickly made it very clear that there is no, for the foreseeable future, there is no next generation can-do. So there's not really much need for future work. So that was becoming very clear that there's a brain trust here in Canada. Uh, we made the third most common type of reactor from a very small country. Um, so we, we know we have the talent here. Um, so that was kind of already bringing me back to Canada. Uh, that open, that desire to keep going on nuclear options, but knowing that there's not much need for advanced type of can-do's. There's increased now corporate interest, or I shouldn't use the word corporate because the main interest is a private company, so they don't have to think just next quarter. They can think 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, they're allowed to. They don't have shareholders. To, their shareholders are the employer. Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, they, they, they're still kicking the tires and all this. They want to remain anonymous for now. Uh, and if, if and when they choose so, they'll, they'll come out in the public. But all these things seem to be coming into place uh, that shows that Canada really is the place that we can get these started. Most likely with international help, most logically with U.S. help, especially the experts at Oak Ridge National Lab where these were developed. But much more than even uh, 12 months ago, I think Canada is really a place to do it. Another aspect of that is what, of, what is left of atomic energy of Canada limit that wasn't privatized is our national labs, Chalk River National Labs mainly, that is really looking for a new, uh, a new focus. They, they are mandated now to, to help new technologies be developed within Canada. And our, our work really ticks all the boxes for them for what they should be doing. And there's really, really rising interest from them uh, for this Made in Canada solution, but for the world and with the, with the world's help touch on some of the specifics for, and implications for Alberta? Molten salt reactors just are a great way to make high temperature heat and the most logical thing to do with high temperature heat is to drive some sort of turbine and steam turbines are the simplest ones we have to make electricity. Uh, but when you make something that's just the best way to make steam or high temperature heat there's a lot more things you can do with that and Right now, for the foreseeable future, the main method of recovering oil sands, uh, bitumen oil sands from the Alberta region and Saskatchewan, um, is by burning lots and lots of natural gas to pump in the ground to help bring out the bitumen. Um, and that in drastically increases your carbon footprint, all that natural gas you have to burn that has very, it's cheap right now, but the long-term price is very unstable and uh, unstable in, in that. So what molten salt reactors can bring is that high temperature heat. Uh, they like pretty high temperature steam, hotter than what conventional reactors can give. And then the other big aspect is conventional reactors are just far too large for these individual sites where you need the steam these SAG D sites, steam assisted gravity drainage. Uh, so molten salt reactors really seem to fit into what they need. Um, inexpensive, high temperature steam, or just the heat itself to help them in converting that really thick, thick bitumen into, into oil without, again, using even more natural gas. Because almost as much natural gas is used to try to upgrade upgrade that bitumen into something that then then can be put through a refinery. 
we can help on every stage to get rid of all that natural gas input. So we can burn that in our homes or natural gas is great for cars uh, instead of just burning it all up to get bitumen. And there's nothing we can do to stop us using oil for at least the next 20, 30 years. So let's at least try to use it better and wean ourselves off it. But uh, I think molten salt reactors can, can help us get that oil in just a environmentally and politically more stable uh, way to do it. I've been um, I've been trying to uh, contact politicians like MPs in uh, Ontario. I had, to, I had to pick one province to start with, so I tried harassing MPs in Ontario, and uh, all of my correspondence was basically referred to Joe Oliver, the Minister of National Resources, and um, he said that uh, Canada's focus is on the supercritical water reactor. Could you? I'm sure that's what he knows. I'm sure that's what he's told. Should Canada be focusing on the supercritical water reactor and why would we fo be focusing on that instead of the molten salt reactor? Supercritical water reactor is a very advanced type of reactor that gives you a, a modest benefit. It doesn't really change the picture on anything really. Um, gives maybe it could be cheaper than what we have now. But it's a lot of people say it's a lot like fusion. It's so hard. The supercritical water is really high pressure, really high temperature. The corrosion and everything is just a monumental challenge. That, um, and to be honest, like the Americans were doing things, Japanese, Canadians, I think we're really one of the last places that's lingering on on this. And this would be developed for for can do for a next generation can do. And the current owners of CANDU have made it quite clear they have no interest. But these funding methods have started. They're just starting the next four years of funding on supercritical water technology that, to be quite honest, in my opinion at least, nobody really wants anymore because they've all realized how hard a problem it is. Um, so that will be the official position for, for, for now that a lot of money money we would love to see for molten salt reactors and we're quite confident we can get changed uh, but this inertia of funding gets going and they're just like i say just starting a four-year next phase of lots of millions of dollars on something no one really wants anymore right now we boil water okay a boiling water reactor actually lets the water boil in the reactor that's quite tricky to do pressurized water reactor doesn't let the water boil but then it transfers heat to water that will boil. When you put water under enough pressure, the water never makes this abrupt change from water liquid to steam. It's more of a gradual just density change, so it, it never really boils anywhere. You just get a really dense, uh, high temperature steam, I guess, but it, it's this gradual. So the idea is it could go through the reactor, pick up lots and lots of heat, come out at a really high temperature, which is good for the thermal efficiency of the turbines. Uh, but it's just such a challenging thing to use as a coolant of reactors. We will probably, at least first generation, couple molten salt reactors to the same type of turbines they want to use. Uh, the best, or mo well, I shouldn't use the word best, but the most efficient coal plants in the world use supercritical steam turbines. Um, when you're just trying to heat water to do that, that's one thing. When you're actually trying to use that super hot water to cool solid fuels, that's a complete different story. But we would use our clean salts to, to, to use supercritical steam turbines, which are quite efficient things. You can push up to 50% of the heat energies converted right into electricity. Any um, remarks or comments that you would like to convey to people that are not academic? What do you fear from nuclear power, or nuclear in general, and then start addressing those? And the biggest single thing we have to tackle is the quite irrational fear of radiation. Uh, things that are radioactive are both a poison and a carcinogen, okay? But we deal with all kinds of things that are both poison and carcinogen. Uh, with radiation, we can quantify things very, if someone is exposed to radiation, we can know exactly how much they, they got. We know how much it takes to either to poison you, to kill you if you got a lot at the one, one time, or you're somewhere, you're getting a lot for weeks or months on end. We know exactly how much it takes to 
uh, to kill someone? How much is a poison? And it's remarkably high, like it's anything less than 10% of how much it would take to kill you, which is a lot of radiation. There's really no statistical evidence for causing cancers. Now, yes, we could be hiding a small amount of increase in kind of the statistical noise, but every time we try to look at this, often the evidence is the other way around, that modest amounts of radiation, and we're talking lots more than background radiation, and background radiation, that's another thing, it can vary by factors of several hundred around the world. So when we talk about evacuating zones that are just one-tenth of what places are that have thousands or hundreds of thousands of people living their lives without any increase of cancer. Anyway, getting back to the fact that it's really hard to pick out these really low levels of cancer increases, but when we, when we, the more we look, the more we see that, geez, maybe there's actual benefit. But we can't, re it's really hard to prove that too. But I really have to get back to the fact that people get drilled in that any radiation, it's definitely gonna kill you, it's just a matter of when, these things are just not true and we really have to, to quantify, try to educate the people, uh, get the truth out there more. But the problem is it is a bit gray uh, because you can hide a little bit of cancer rates. But when we start talking, even if some of the theories, there's something called linear no threshold where they look at if, if they know how much it takes to kill you, if 100 people got 1% of what would kill you, that theory says one of those people will die. And there's really not much scientific background to that as opposed to just a convenient way to regulate things. So when you use that theory, even in something as bad as Chernobyl, when the scientists applied that theory for all the millions of people that got a, a bit more radiation, and then the 100,000 workers that got a lot, but less than that 10% of what will kill you, even applying that, I think uh, the estimate was still only three to 4,000 people getting fatal cancers over like 30, 40, 50 year period. And that's not great, but even in that flawed theory, the worst possible nuclear accident we can imagine where the, almost the entire core goes up and spreads out over Europe, even with that flawed theory, uh, the science is saying it's, it's still not much more than uh, a bad industrial accident like Bhopal or a dam burst. Uh, and when you use those theories for Fukushima, it's basically almost no one. And again, I come back to the fact that those don't seem to be legitimate theories. And there's a lot of evidence that as long as you don't get ridiculous amounts of radiation, um, that it's not going to give you cancer and there's a good chance it actually helps prime your system because your cells are built to, to repair cell damage. Uh, it might be a little bit like working a muscle, uh, you help it a little bit of insult, as they say, and there's even theories that different kind of stresses actually help the cells to, to fight cancers later. So trying to educate the public against this, what I think and most scientists think is a irrational fear of radiation, uh, which of course also starts with the media not hyping everything, uh, fear cells, so meltdown is going to destroy a country. And we had three meltdowns, full meltdown, or one full meltdown of couple other partial meltdowns in Fukushima and still very little was released. Uh, a lot according to, to some, but again, nowhere near the levels that are going to hurt anyone, even by the flawed linear no threshold theories. Uh, so that's the big thing, trying to help with that ed education of the fear of radiation, but then looking at all the other aspects, the long lived waste that's such an insolvable problem. It's not insolvable for even what we have, but these reactors can can completely change that dynamic so that uh, the waste we have is really only this poison and or possible carcinogen for basically hundreds of years instead of 100,000 years. So we, we can, you can trust an engineer to make a container that's gonna keep that in there for hundreds of years, but I can see how the distrust of something that they try to make for hundreds of thousands. Uh, so yeah, looking at looking at the, the things that give people pause for current nuclear reactors are probably exaggerated. Uh, and even if they aren't, what we were trying to propose can help feel, uh, ease those fears greatly.
Do you have anything along the lines of what electricity is used for beyond a dishwasher? Well, we use electricity across the board. We also use fossil fuels, liquid fuels for our cars and things like that. There's lots of effort trying to electrify cars. And if we had a clean, sustainable form of energy for that electricity for the cars, it's a lot better than plugging in now, but it's a coal plant down the road that's spewing out sulfur dioxide and CO2 and everything else. Um, but that said, if we had these good high temperature nuclear reactors functioning, they can also be used to make liquid fuels, a carbon source, uh, water by hydrolysis or electrolysis of water, uh, sorry, hydrogen by electrolysis of water combined, we can make these liquid fuels. Um, so even that we can kind of replace. These things are going to take 10, 20 years to do to phase things out, but these reactors can help with that. But uh, just fundamental electricity is so important to our lives and right now the the main source is big coal plants uh, and natural gas turbines which are better but they're not any kind of they're not that much better and all of those things even coal has people talk about pe peak coal sorry peak oil and even the ex the oil sand or oil executives are are really buying into this and they realize this is an issue there's uh, people talk about coal everywhere i've read a lot of articles that even even coal gets a lot overestimated uh, how much there is, et cetera. Uh, and we know the world population is increasing. We're using more energy. If we don't have a solution, we're gonna be using a lot more coal. And how much do we have of that? But even, even if that's not true at all, there's just the whole environmental picture of burning too much coal. How did you first hear about molten salt reactors? During my PhD, I, I was a physicist and sort of inventive by nature, and that draws a lot of people like me into the fusion fu field. So I did, I, some of my scholarship money was in that field and played with ideas in that, but just kind of discovered, geez, this fission stuff uh, pretty much does what fusion is asking. And when you start thinking of ideas, you realize, my God, they looked at so many different ways in the 50s and 60s, not just what we ended up with, these reactors that were kind of made because they fit the best in a nuclear submarine, uh, that there's a lot of better ways to do these. But all that kind of research kept coming back to these molten salt reactors that were, were almost developed to the stage we could start using them so long ago in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. Um, that my work kept coming back to those, so I had to finish my PhD, get some, get some work to pay for a while, but when I got back into things with new ideas to improve the molten salts, that's where I went in full time five or six years ago on, these, on this technology. Have you talked to the guys who worked on the original molten salt reactors? Yes, yes, uh, and it's an amazing group down there, and uh, some of the main gentlemen are in their mid, late 80s, still as sharp as a tack, remember every little thing. Oak Ridge was also amazing at documenting every, every aspect of work they did. Uh, it's a funny thing because this was the main focus of Oak Ridge for decades and it was very abruptly cut off and it was a very bitter pill to swallow for them. And it became, it was so bitter that you almost couldn't mention it for probably 10, 15 years after. Uh, so a lot of these, these great minds they thought their life work had kind of gone to waste, but now they're into their 70s or 80s and they see this resurgence of interest. Uh, and I, I want to involve them so much more and I think they're, they're so happy to see uh, um, that this is coming back. I spoke to one gentleman who by this time couldn't communicate that well, uh, but I got a lot, especially through his son, that he was so happy to, to see that this was coming back. That, that all the great things they did weren't, weren't going to waste. Does this technology, is it really going to affect the economy or is it simply going to benefit the, the, the industry or the businesses that invest in it? Well, it's definitely going to benefit the economy and we would have a very hard time if this was just kind of break even, like it's as good as what we got, but it's a better environmental picture, long sustainability, waste picture, 
uh, that would still be a good reason, reason to try to go to these technologies. But pragmatically speaking, we have to realize that if, it, if it's not making better economic sense, we're not going to interest governments, industries, et cetera. Governments to some extent for the better environmental picture, but it has to be that economic case too, that um, energy is expensive now. Oil is very, very expensive and running out. Uh, we need to wean ourselves off it. Um, but, and these reactors can be so much less expensive. Nuclear power existing now is a, is a pretty good option, but it's certainly not an inexpensive option and it's not going to expand too much. These small modular reactors are great and they probably will build several of them, but they're not going to make much of a difference in the overall picture. We need lots of these built to really make a big difference. And the only way a lot of them are going to be built is if you make them cheaper than existing nuclear, cheaper than oil, cheaper than natural gas, cheaper than coal. Or at least close to coal. And uh, we, we're quite sure we can make it cheaper than coal. Uh, but as long as you're close to coal, people are going to choose something over coal. But I shouldn't pick on coal too much. Uh, I get picked on enough. Screw coal. Come on. <laughs> okay. Whatever. <laughs> we're not fans of coal here. Do you want to say anything pertaining to solar or wind? Wind is reasonably economic, uh, at least if it's exactly where you need it. It's not that economic when you need to spend tens of billions of dollars to, to put in the power lines to bring it from where it is. Uh, we, we do need wind and solar. They, they should be part of the energy picture. Uh, but beyond a few minority views, uh, it's really hard to imagine they, they could ever crack above that kind of 20%. They're just not, they're not there when you need them. They're not 24 hours a day. Uh, it's proven like fusion was so hard to do. Storing energy cheaply has been a remarkably difficult challenge for 50 to 100 years. Uh, batteries are not cheap. Uh, it's remarkably hard to store a lot of power. That's what makes these systems not ideal for base load. So they're part, they should be part of the mix. Solar is a beautiful fit with uh, nuclear because uh, nuclear likes to kind of go steady state, same thing, 24 hours a day. Whereas in the city, especially in the United States, a bright, sunny, hot day is when everyone air AC kicks in full blast. But that's exactly when the solar energy output is peaking. Whereas wind is a lot more random. It can be in the middle of the night when you don't really need anything. So solar and nuclear actually have a better partnership. But if people are trying to put all their eggs in the basket, and oh, we'll just stop all oil, we'll stop all nuclear, and we'll just go to hydro, wind, and uh, there's not much more hydro we can do. Well, hydro is wonderful, but there's not much more we can do. We can't just try to put all our eggs in, one, in the basket of wind and solar and hope for the best. Or if it doesn't pan out, it's not going to be a pretty world. Would you say the same then for MSR? Is that we're not putting all our eggs in the MSR basket? This could be the basket. This could be almost all our energy production. Uh, but it doesn't need to be. And we're not asking for hundreds of billions or tens of billions or trillions of dollars to develop this. It's not going to take that much to really prove our case. Um, and when you look at the billions and billions that are spent on all kinds of energy, it's really a no-brainer to let's at least get some funding on this. And there does seem to be a lot of, governments are hard to, they want to follow business, what business wants. Corporations are very hard to, corporate interest beyond the next quarter is, or everyone's chasing the next Google or Facebook and they're going broke doing it. Um, but there is a lot of long term, or visionary money, uh, the super angels, the Bill Gates types and that. Well, Bill Gates is funding a, another type of reactor that I don't think has too, too much hope. Um, but though that, that funding sources do exist, and I really think they're, they're really kind of looking around, sniffing around the edges. But we need a credible, large effort on this uh, with the right people, the, a big team on this. Once that gets in place, which is hard to do, but it seems to be happening, and hopefully you're in Canada, uh, I don't think there's going to be shortage of of the not that much money on the grand scheme of things that we'll need for this. Uh, I'm confident that's going to be the, almost the other way. We'll have to, <laughs> have to uh, cut off people that want to get in on the ground floor on this. So. But I'll try to be optimistic that way.
Um, so when I wrote to Joe Oliver, the Minister of Natural Resources, yep. he quoted Stephen, Stephen Chu and of course the U.S. Um, Secretary of Energy. Uh, he has repeatedly pointed out that uh, a liquid-fueled reactor is a proliferation concern. I don't believe he ever has gone into greater detail than that. Do you, um, do you have any thoughts on this being a peripheral pro proliferation concern? Molten salt reactors, that's a very broad category of beast, okay? There's a lot of different ways we can run them. Uh, when you talk about the breeder option, the thorium producing uranium-233, there is anti-proliferation features sort of built into that. Uh, but it gets very hard to pick out if if that's enough because that cycle uranium-233 as is it's not a wonderful weapons material but it is a potential weapons material and usually when you get comments about the liquid fuel reactors or thorium in general it's because of that this is categorized as highly enriched uranium in every reactor there's no reactor or there's some research reactors that still use highly enriched uranium in that case uranium-235 but highly enriched means it can be used in a weapon and we're trying to get rid we're trying to change all those reactors to low enriched uranium so there is very valid concerns and it is a, a strong concern of mine that a lot in the what you might call the thorium community or molten salt advocates they tend to uh, there's probably not a real legitimate proliferation concern of the reactors but i really am quite upset about how some very few but just some sort of fringe elements of things try to make it sound like this is some magic solution to proliferation and it's definitely not with the pure thorium to uranium 233 cycle um, like i said there is anti proliferation to it but it's not a solution that said, there's other ways to run the molten salt reactor that I think are much higher in proliferation resistance compared to, well, light water reactors or the pure cycle. Uh, in these ways, the denatured molten salt reactor keep the uranium always in a state that's useless for weapons. Uh, there's, there's this really low level concern of plutonium in reactors because unless you build a reactor to make plutonium for weapons, it's always this mix of isotopes that's quite useless for weapons. How useless it is, we're not 100%. You maybe could make something that gives a, a modest or, well, fairly large explosion, but not very large. Um, but that exists already in light water reactors. In these, this simple, the denatured molten salt reactor approach, uh, that plutonium that would be in the salt is even much poorer and unlike uranium which is not that hard to take out of the salts the plutonium is much much harder to take out uh, so these this way to run the molten salt reactor has been singled out in studies that looked at how could we really maximize proliferation resistance uh, all that said uh, a determined effort can always find a way okay uh, it's always going to be very uh, large challenge though and hopefully quite obvious and I keep coming back to the fact that at some point you have to realize we can only make it so difficult or you, you just, well, let's start making anthrax or nerve gas or something and any country can do that. So weapons of mass destruction are obviously something we have to always guard against. But uh, you can't just say that we can't do nuclear because there's the remotest chance of that. Because even if we magically found a way, and you can't uninvent enrichment technology, if we shut all the reactors down in the world and shut all the enrichment plants, that knowledge still exists. It doesn't really change anything. Um, and any pharmaceutical plant in the world could be converted to make oodles and oodles of anthrax. We don't think, why would a nation ever really do that? They know the rest of the world would then just destroy them kind of thing. So. All that said, uh, proliferation in general gets overblown, but there is some legitimate concerns to some unique proliferation issues with the pure cycle, but that's a part of the reason, and but much more for simplicity, that I prefer the ways that they just use low enriched uranium, that the uranium at least is pretty much useless for any kind of weapons. Okay, I think that was good, Dave. Thanks a lot. Okay. Oh.